The Conch Shell Suite was composed in 1965 as a music concrete experiment based on two recordings. The first, a field recording made in India in 1964 in Bhuvaneshwar, Orissa, of a musician Antar Jyami Muni playing two conch shells simultaneously. And the second, a recording made in London a year later by myself playing a box zither called Surmandal. Both recordings were manipulated by the addition of echo, pitch change, and the former also by multiple tracking. In the first movement, the conch shells are featured by themselves, and in the second movement with the surmandal. The suite was intended to have at least one more movement with the conch being pitted against percussion instruments. But the first two movements were so time-consuming that I let my friends and associates convince me that I had better things to do with my time. After its inception, I played it for one or two of my friends in England. But their reaction to it was utterly negative, and so it sat on the shelf for more than two decades. It resurfaced in the 90s, and once again I played it occasionally for friends. I can't say that it was a big hit, but as I recall, one or two listeners were intrigued. One of them happened to be a UCLA Music Department professor of composition, Elaine Barkin, who urged me to submit it for the Music Faculty Composers Concert in 1996. This was the only non-live item in the concert, and was used as the opening piece. To my surprise, several individuals expressed their appreciation of the piece and asked to hear it again. They also wanted to know how it was constructed. And so I offered the conch shell suite on this CD, followed by an explanation of its background for those that might be interested.
I made the recording of the two conch shells while on sabbatical from the school of Or conducting a field trip through Saurashtra, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Orissa, Bihar, and Uttar Pradesh. On this trip, I was accompanied by Dr. Anders Felix von Lampsbeere of the Tropical Institute in Amsterdam and my uncle Jakub, a singer of Muslim devotional songs called Kabbali. A narrative account of this field trip with musical examples was presented in a series of 10 BBC radio broadcasts in 1969 and was subsequently published by the Department of Ethnomusicology at UCLA in 1988 with photographs and additional data. The particular occasion of the conch shell recording was the All India Conference of the Congress Party, which that year was held in Bhuvaneshwar, Orissa. As is usual at national and international conferences in India, many city and village performers from the home state were invited to entertain the guests. There were several outstanding performances, but that of Antarjami Muni playing two conch shells simultaneously I found simply breathtaking. The conch shell has been used as an end-blown shell trumpet for at least 2,500 years in India. Its use in the early days was for signalling purposes in times of war, but its sound was considered to be auspicious, so that it was also associated with sacred and ceremonial occasions. This association still continues today, and the conch is regularly used in Hindu rituals. Although the instrument is quite common today, it is used primarily for its musical expression. This is what makes Antarjami's performance so unusual, because he played two conch shells simultaneously for musical purposes, not for their sacred associations. His performance may not be regarded as musical in the conventional Indian sense, since it involves neither raga nor tala. Nevertheless, he employs what I believe to be one of the fundamental elements of musical expression, the manipulation of tension and relaxation. This he achieved in a remarkable manner. The two shells were pitched about a semitone apart, and in this demonstration, Antarjami plays them separately. When he plays them together, one notices that he alters the pitches of each one by as much as he uses the frequency and intensity of the beats produced by the conscious in a functional manner, not only to create a varying sense of restlessness and repose, but also to support the varying rhythms which he creates by the pulsing of his breath. Here's a short extract illustrating his technique. Thank you. 
My recording of Antar Jiami took place after he had finished his stage performance for the Congress. They heard not a jot, being so enwrapped in their machinations as evidenced by their continual mumbling. On the stage, I recall his performance was longer and even more spectacular and included a section in which he enunciated Hindi words through his conch sounds that many in the linguistically heterogeneous group could understand. When I saw him close up, I suddenly realized that he not only used circular breathing so that he could produce a continuous stream of sounds for several minutes, but he was also able to control the intensity of the breath going into each shell independently and could separate his breath into two distinct controllable streams. Here is my complete recording of his performance. Thank you. 
I had encountered nothing like this in all my research, and have still to find something quite Army himself was, however, quite modest about his own accomplishments, because he said that his father used to play five conches at the same time, whereas he could play only two. Perhaps Anthur Giammi was exaggerating, but the thought of what the sound of five conch shells might have been remained with me long after the completion of my field trip. And then one evening, sitting in my basement in Northwood, Middlesex, I began to play around with Anthur Giammi's conch shell recording using my two tape recorders. Of course, synthesizers and the like had not been invented or barely known in 64. But I had my two tape recorders, one a reflectograph that had a cone-shaped spindle against which the capstan rolled. A knob enabled the capstan to be raised up or down, thus enabling a variation in the running speed of the tape and a corresponding increase or decrease in pitch. The other was a revox, which enabled multi-tracking and a simple echo with one-seventh of a second delay as one could feed the sound from the recording head back to the playback head. I found the possibilities for manipulating musical sounds thoroughly fascinating, even though they were grossly limited by today's standards, and found myself drawn to my basement evening after evening, manipulating the conch shell sounds, varying their pitch and overlaying one shell sound over another like this extract. As with some of my paintings, I had no idea just when a definite form began. But after months of experimentation, when I should have been writing technical papers to advance my career, a pattern did begin to form, and I found a beginning, a middle, and an end for the conch shell piece. But after I distanced myself from it for a few weeks on listening to it again, I conceived the notion of making it into a suite, and tried pitting the sounds of a surmandal, the dulcimer, or trapezoidal boxes that there were 27 single coarse strings against the conches. While his Persian counterpart, Santur, also used North Indian classical music, is played with two strikers. The surmandal is usually strummed with the fingers of one hand, and the instrument held upright with the other. It is used as a kind of background accompaniment by singers of North Indian and Pakistani classical music. The playing technique varies. Some singers, picking out the notes they sing, while others strum the strings more or less indiscriminately. Since these surmantal techniques have not been illustrated elsewhere, I have included two short examples here. The first of these was sung by the late Bade Gulam Ali Khan Sahib in 1963 in Bombay, propped up in bed and recovering from a serious stroke. Note the way he picks out the notes of the surmantal to reinforce specific notes of his song. Ah, ah, 
The second is by the late Umra Bundu Khan Sahib, whom I recall. His technique employs far more open runs, and he picks out particular notes only occasionally. <laughs> Jigamadani nida 
ಗಪ ಮಮ ಗ ಗ ಮ ಗ ರ ಗ ರ ನ ರ ಗ ಪ ರ ಗ ಮ ಗ ರ ಗ ರ ಸ ಸ ಸ ಸ ಗ ಧ ನ ರ ಗ ರ ಧ ಮ ಗ ಮ ದ ನಿ ನಿ ರ ಮ ಗ ಮ ದ ನಿ ಸ ಸ ನಿ ದ ನಿ ನಿ ರ ಮ ದ ನಿ ರ ಗ ರ ನಿ ದ ನಿ ರ ಸ ನಿ ಮ ಮ ನಿ ರ ಮ ಗ ಮ ನಿ ದ ಪ ಮ ಮ ಗ ಗ ಮ ಗ ರ ನಿ ದ ಪ ಮ ಗ ಮ ಗ ರ ನಿ ರ ಗ ಪ ರ ಗ ಪ ರ ಸ ಗ ಗ ಗ ಧ ನಿ ರ ಗ For the conch shell suite, I play the surmandal with the fingers of both hands. The microphone was placed virtually in contact with the resonating body of the instrument. My tuning was completely unconventional, the idea being to attempt to communicate feelings and emotions without using recognizable musical pitches. To create something of a parallel to the slightly divergent tuning of the two conches played by Antar Giammi, I tuned some of the strings slightly out of tune with each other to create beats as he did with his two conches. While I do not have a recording of the tuning I used, the following extract from one of my early surmandal experiments may give some impression of it. During the many hours it took to construct this work, I found it useful to imagine the first of the conch as it achieved supremacy over other life forms in the ocean. As it gained in strength, it began looking for the light on the surface of the ocean and rising towards it. The painting on the CD cover, Seeking the Light, was painted not long after the conch shell suite, probably in 1967 in England, using tempera paints. It attempts to depict life forms driving ever upward to get closer to the source of the light. Although it has no pictorial reference to conch shells, I feel sure that the conch shell suite influenced the painting. In the second movement of the suite, I imagine the conches reaching out of the ocean into the sunlight, and then, as they attempted to spread their influence over land, they encountered the resistance of the surmandal whose plucked notes represent the percussive sounds of land-based animals, as contrasted with the fluidity of ocean dwellers represented by the conches. After several skirmishes, the suite ends with the supremacy of the land forces being established and the destruction of the conches.